So uh, welcome, everybody, uh, to this panel on independent counsel. And as I promised on Facebook, we will almost certainly also talk about the Kavanaugh nomination. Um, that's not a joke. <laughs> um, so uh, my name is John Yu. I'm a visiting scholar here and a professor at Berkeley and also a fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. And, uh, Judge Starr originally was going to give a lecture, but he actually would like to actually sit and have a conversation with the panelists. So we're going to dispense with any kind of formal remarks. He's going to make, a, I think, a short statement summarizing his book and some of the points. And then we're going to turn right to an open discussion with the other panelists. So let me just quickly introduce them. You have their full biographies. But as you all know, Judge Starr uh, has been many, many things, a judge on the DC Circuit, solicitor general, a law school dean. It's all been downhill after being law school dean, <laughs> university president, and an independent counsel in the Clinton Whitewater investigation. Uh, Vicki Tensing herself has also been uh, a special counsel, a bit an investigator, also a deputy assistant attorney general in the criminal division, and I think one of the uh, most respected commentators right now on the course of the Mueller investigation. And then to her right is Sai Prakash, who's a professor at the University of Virginia Law School. Uh, for those of you who are, don't follow the law reviews, I hope none of you here do. <laughs> Sai is actually probably the scholar, I think, in the country who has most deeply thought about and written about the independent counsel law and uh, special prosecutors generally. So we'll uh, go for a short uh, while with Judge Starr going first and then some questions and answers, and then we'll open it all up uh, to you uh, on this, uh, I think, this uh, uh, day that is an amazing intersection given we all uh, have thought and written about independent councils. We all, all of us have also thought, written about uh, the advice and consent function of the Senate and the Supreme Court. So I'm sure we're, our discussion will take us to both topics. But uh, Judge Starr, why don't you begin? Well, thank you. And thanks, John, for uh, organizing this. And to my friends at uh, AEI, uh, we love the American Enterprise Institute and for the opportunities that it provides to talk about very important uh, issues in serious ways. And so thank you uh, again, and thank you all for uh, being here. Uh, let me make basically two points, one about the book. But before that, the preface to the book is, how do you investigate a president of the United States? What's the right mechanism? Uh, I'm not talking about issuing subpoenas and drawing up indictments. What is the mechanism if a president <laughs> is going to be investigated? And I think we'll have a lively conversation about this. And the nation has really struggled uh, with the how. Uh, it's accepted the proposition that, OK, we must. Now, there's a very interesting conversation to be had. Really? Must we? We'll talk about that. But thus far, the national consensus has been yes. Why? Because we want honest government. We want honest government beginning at the top. And if there's serious suggestions of non-honest government, criminal activity, then we, the people, want to have ordered liberty and that no one is above the law. Everyone here could sort of give that speech uh, and, and mean it. The nation began this experiment with investigating the president and those close to the president, I should add that footnote, uh, during the untidy administration of Ulysses S. Grant. Many of you have, I'm sure, read or at least you're familiar with Ron Chernow's recent book. And one of his chapters is devoted to the so-called whiskey ring. Big controversy. Uh, and so how are we going to investigate a scandal uh, in the Grant administration that might touch the president? Happily, it didn't, but clearly implicated his secretary of the Treasury. And Ulysses S. Grant himself made the decision. Appoint a special, we call him now special counsel. He made that decision. Uh, he believed in the idea of clean government, of somebody, if we've got a dirty character running around, a rotten apple, let's uh, ferret it, uh, it out. By the way, within a year, uh, General Grant himself fired that special prosecutor. But the theory was, we will go, since we're a Republican administration under General Grant, we will go to the other political party and we'll bring in a Democrat politician from the Show Me State because the epicenter of the alleged whiskey ring was St. Louis, Missouri. We've had other examples of presidential or those close to the president investigations with the most remarkable having been Teapot Dome, done as a model of efficiency and unusually so by the special prosecutors being appointed with the president's approbation 
by, uh, confirmed, excuse me, by the United States Senate. And the idea is, let's have one of each. It's a Republican administration, let's have one Democrat uh, investigator, special counsel, let's have one Republican. It worked out pretty well. Uh, uh, Atlee Pomerine, the Democrat, uh, and Owen J. Roberts, future United States uh, Supreme Court Justice, got along just great and apparently uh, uh, resolved the issues uh, fairly quickly. The criminal prosecution of one Albert Fall, get it? Uh, <laughs> the Secretary of the uh, Interior. May I proceed or should I? Or is it an evacuation order? In, okay, let's in, talk uh, about uh, Kavanaugh. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah. We've had enough, we, we, we got enough just, history. Uh, <laughs> the special, but this I do need to say, Watergate was to me a confirmation that the system in fact was working in that so a special prosecutor, called a special prosecutor, is appointed the discretion of the attorney general. He didn't have to do it under the law, but he did. Archibald Cox is chosen. Then the Saturday night massacre, Cox is fired. Robert Bork becomes the acting attorney general, is the very distinguished solicitor general, and he appoints Leon Jaworski. Now the rest is all history. The system seemed to work its way through the firing, that Saturday night massacre. But a reformed Congress said, no, we need a sturdier mechanism, less uncertainty, less ad hocery, and thus the independent counsel statute was passed in 1978 as part of a broader uh, law called the Ethics and Government Act of 1978. So this is one chapter of this broad sweeping law seeking to make sure that we had none of the mischief that the nation had gone through during the Nixon administration. That uh, measure lasted for 21 years. It was said of prohibition, it was the noble experiment. Some would question the nobility of the experiment, but it clearly was an experiment in terms of inter intruding into private life, the role of the states and the, and the like. It, of course, lasted a very short period of time, a little over a decade. The 18th uh, Amendment was then uh, rescinded. The noble experiment was over. Well, it took 21 years for, if it was a noble experiment, for the special prosecutor law to expire. It came through different uh, iterations, tweaked every five years. Every five years, Congress would say, we need to improve this law. There were calls to jettison the law and to return to the tradition of the executive branch determining in its own discretion when to go outside the executive branch and to bring in a special prosecutor for this special uh, project. I was the last appointed independent counsel. <laughs> a great honor. <laughs> the Republicans fell out of love to the extent that they had been in love with the independent counsel statute. Uh, during uh, Judge Walsh's investigation of Iran-Contra. Some of you are old enough to remember the Reagan administration, right? And if you did live through, as some of us here did, uh, the Reagan administration, we remember ever so vividly Iran-Contra and Judge Walsh's investigation, wildly controversial. <laughs> I saw Victoria nodding over here. I wanted to make sure she wasn't nodding asleep. I'm nearly through. Uh, then the uh, Democrats fell out of love with the independent counsel statute by virtue of the Monica Lewinsky. Even Whitewater itself was a little bit problematic, but the die was cast with Lewinsky. And so in 1999, at long last, the experiment came to an end that had begun in 1978. Looking ahead to the demise of the statute, Janet Reno put in place regulations that stand to this day uh, they may have been tweaked, Sai and others will know about it, but the essential structure, the key point, <coughs> is that the Attorney General, or the Acting Attorney General, in this instance of the Mueller investigation, has the appointing authority under regulation. So it's not just an ad hoc decision, it's a judgment on the fourth floor, or the fifth floor, of the Justice Department guided by and shaped by those regulations, and that is our current system. Well, how's that working? We'll talk about that. Point two, believe it or not, that was point one, the book. <laughs> but now I'm gonna be very brief. Uh, I was moved to write the book 
by virtue of my newfound freedom, when, and we've got some Baylor Bears here, uh, I was dismissed as the president of Baylor, and then I said, I'm not going to continue working here as much as I love the institution. So I resigned, I was not fired for cause, as, uh, as, as hey, that's not a laugh line. <laughs> What the that, statute goes to, says. that goes to integrity. These are independent uh, council junkies. That's what oh, yeah, the statute exactly. says. So, yeah, that's right. <laughs> With just cause, the attorney general, right. how I begged that I would get fired. But it, it, <laughs> it, it, it never happened as, as independent counsel. No, I love Baylor to this day. So I resigned as <laughs> chancellor. And I said, item one, you know, play with the grandchildren uh, a little bit more. But secondly, I really want to write my book about Baylor because I so loved telling the Baylor story and I was no longer telling it. So it was, I was suffering from some sort of opioid-like withdrawal. I loved the place and I had the zeal of the newly converted. So I wrote a book and the book was coming to an end in November of 2016. It wrote very quickly and then Hillary lost the election and people for years had been saying, you must write your own story. It's your story as well. Bill wrote his in my life and said some not flattering things about you. Have you no answer? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, and yes, I can. So that was then the occasion that gave rise to the book when I thought that the historical record needed to be, from my perspective, completed. The record including the fact that we found significant evidence of criminality on the part of both Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton in the Arkansas phase of the investigation. I tell that whole story, how we struggled with, do we have the evidence to indict? We felt that Bill Clinton committed perjury in the Arkansas phase of the investigation. And then, of course, I tell that part of the story. But from my perspective, and also in a deep and personal way, the Monica Lewinsky phase, how we connected the Lewinsky phase back to Arkansas and the other far-flung nature of our investigation, which I inherited from a very able, appointed by the Attorney General, Special Counsel Bob Fisk, because the person who pointed us to Monica Lewinsky and says, I am being encouraged to commit perjury by a woman who I've come to know here at the Pentagon, who has this relationship with the president and who has herself filed a perjurious affidavit in this civil rights case, this sexual harassment case. And you know who I am. So I tell this story. Well, who are you? I'm Linda Tripp, executive assistant to the late Vincent Foster Jr., who was an important witness for us in the death investigation of Vince Foster. That's how it began. If you choose to read the book, you'll see how it ended. But I guess they already know. But the other thing I wanted to say about that is that, because I was encouraged for this to be a memoir, so I talk about the family, the pressures on the family, all members of the family, including Alice. Would you stand up, please, and be recognized? Because she, she watched Geraldo before Geraldo <laughs> went to, over to Fox News and has a very changed persona. <laughs> it used to be then, Jerry Rivers. He did? Yes. Oh. Well, you learn something. When you talk to John Yu, you're going to learn something. So um, Alice really bore such a, a, a brunt of that because one of the things I encouraged our colleagues to do when the maelstrom really began is shield your eyes from all of the coverage. Do your best to discipline yourself so that you seal it out. Friends may talk to you, call you up those pre-internet <clears throat> days. But you don't have to read the Washington Post or whatever. But I don't mean to knock the Washington Post because one of the things that sort of surprised people who come and said, I had no idea that the New York Times, not editorially, had some reporters on the beat. They were, you call them truth seekers. Yes, they did. The Washington Post had truth seekers on the staff. Yes, it did. Now, this is 20 years ago. Uh, NBC News, Lisa Myers, truth seeker. I could keep mm -hmm. going on and on with the people in the so-called mainstream media who just said, I just want to know the truth. Bob Franken of CNN, when CNN was really early on. Bob Franken, now retired, was a truth seeker. So I tell all this in the book, but my bottom line is don't go back to the independent counsel statute. All right, thanks, Judge. Uh, Victoria? Here, here. Wait. Yeah. 
When I did Geraldo a lot, yeah. uh, during the OJ trial, we were very much in sync. When I did Geraldo a lot, during the Independent <laughs> Council, uh, we were not very much in sync. <laughs> it was a whole different Geraldo. Yeah. I, I agree with you. Um, I want to talk today about something very timely about the special counsel, and that is, should President Trump agree to be interviewed by Bob Mueller? I don't think it will surprise anybody who knows me to say a resounding no. And um, the reasons for my no are several, and they're rooted in constitutional and policy issues as well as the executive privilege. First, let's set the stage. A sitting president cannot be indicted. And that determination is based on policy and the Constitution, and written in two OLC opinions, written two decades apart, one by the Nixon Justice Department, the other by the Clinton Justice Department. And significantly, when the Clinton DOJ reviewed the Nixon OLC opinion, and intervening court opinions, which is why they, they wrote it, they concluded as follows. Our view remains that a sitting president is constitutionally immune from indictment and criminal prosecution. So all these Democratic pundits, and specifically, most recently, the US uh, Democratic senators, um, shame on them for criticizing Brett Kavanaugh for agreeing with those OLC decisions, because they are just misleading the public about what is an accepted bipartisan position of DOJ. The, let me just discuss these OLC opinions. I have them with me if anybody wants to read them afterwards. I, I feel carrying things around, you sort of get it by osmosis. You know. <laughs> but um, the OLC opinions dealt with policy. Uh, they, said, they looked at like, you know, how in the heck can modern presidency, they're going to be so distracted. And here's a great quote that I love from it. It says, the spectacle of an indicted president still trying to serve as the chief executive boggles the mind. And indeed it does. And if you've just seen the investigation over the last year, year and a half. But the overriding concern was really constitutional, that a criminal process would undo a due election, a valid election would shift the, here's their quote, an awesome power to unelect persons, unelected persons lacking any constitutional role. The president is elected by the whole country, as we all know, and it would be incongruous, says OLC, to bring him down by one prosecutor and a jury of 12 just sort of selected by chance off the street. Additionally, the OLC observed that, mm, you know, the president's he's head of the executive branch, he controls the evidence with the executive privilege. He's superior to whoever would be indicting him, and he has the pardon power. He cannot, at the same time, be a criminal defendant. So, as we all know, Mueller is appointed uh, by the executive. We'll get into that in a minute. Uh, but he must comply with the rules as such. So important issues flow from that threshold maxim. One is the separation of powers. Mueller cannot utilize the awesome power of the executive to get evidence to give to the legislative branch for impeachment when that's a purely legislative function. No, Ken, that your statute had you do that. And in fact, the report went over to Congress and they used it. But that provision was never challenged. And I would have. I would have. I would have challenged it. Another issue is abuse of the grand jury. The U.S. Attorney's Manual says quite plainly, grand jury has but two functions, to return an indictment or a no true bill. So how can Bob Mueller use a grand jury for something other than an indictment or getting a no true bill? I want to turn now to um, the questions that uh, Mueller has proffered. They were all leaked out. Um, they raise constitutional and privileged issues, too. Here's what the leaked questions uh, show. Mueller wants to ask Trump why he fired Comey and General Flynn. 
the Constitution says all the executive power is vested in the president. The president can fire somebody for many reasons, one reason or no reason whatsoever. And if President Trump agrees to answer even one question about why he fired either of these men or any other Article II function, he would diminish the authority of the presidency and besides waiving executive privilege. Moreover, if firing Comey is an obstruction of justice, Dr. Rosenstein wrote a scathing memo recommending that firing. So Rod Rosenstein is a co-conspirator. <laughs> At the very least, he's a witness. Now, now, wait a minute, I've never heard of somebody supervising an investigation in which that person is at the least a witness and maybe a co-conspirator of what's being investigated? That's for another panel. I'll, I'll, go, I'll get back to my subject. Um, in addition to the constitutional and executive privilege issues, there's also case law governing the issue of when the president uh, has to provide evidence. The, the courts like to say, quote, the president is not readily available to give evidence. It's a nice little phrase. I like it. It's a judicial policy, much like those OLC opinions. It's taking into account the demands of the presidency. Um, the case involves a subpoena to the Clinton White House in, for all us civil timers, the investigation of Secretary of Agriculture Michael Espy. We all remember that. And by the way, independent counsel Don Schmoltz, which must have been before you because you were, uh, we, we you were, were the last one. You were concurrent. We were concurrent. By the way, my husband... Joe Genova was an independent counsel, and he never indicted anybody and apologized to them at the end. But after counsel Don, independent counsel Don Smaltz spent $20 million, uh, SB was acquitted in a few hours of the, all 30 counts. Uh, SB was charged with taking gifts, and Schmaltz couldn't get a quid pro quo there for the, any official act for the gifts. But the Clinton White House had also done a, a simultaneous uh, investigation while the independent counsel was doing so. So, of course, when trial pending, the independent counsel wants, what, the fruits of the White House labors. So, of course, they subpoena the White House, and, of course, the White House says executive privilege. So the fight was on, and it went up to the Court of Appeals in D.C., and the SB Court remanded, saying there must be a, quote, demonstrated specific need for evidence in a pending criminal trial. That standard is defined as evidence that is material to the matter and not available elsewhere with due diligence. The language and policy tracks the Nixon tapes case, which dealt with White House tapes to be turned over because there was a pending criminal trial. The case had nothing to do with a president being interviewed or the court saying, hey, the president's got to give up the evidence, as some people on CNN, some other places opine. The Nixon case held that the tapes had to be turned over in camera, and only those relevant and material should be produced. And the Supreme Court language in this area, this, this is why I have all these papers in front of me, because I have to get to the, I cannot memorize all these quotes. <laughs> but the Supreme Court said, quote, the trial court has a heavy responsibility to see that presidential conversations, which are neither relevant nor admissible, are accorded the high degree of respect due the President of the United States. So courts are differential to the presidency for acquiring evidence. For all the journalists, journalists who cavil that the President is not above the law, well, they are too. That's the same kind of higher standard that is provided journalists when they're being subpoenaed about their stories. It's the same kind of standard that is given for us lawyers when we're being subpoenaed about our representation. So let's return to what we're talking about here, this, the present counsel situation. Last I checked, there was no criminal trial. In fact, Rosenstein won't even reveal whether he had in his brain even the concept of some kind of criminal statute when he, when he appointed Mueller. And the latest word from the former FBI lawyer, Lisa Page, is that at the time Mueller was appointed, there was no evidence of collusion, much less a crime. And Mueller is not revealing whether he has uncovered a crime other than babbling about obstruction. And, and this is an issue right now between Jay and Rudy and the special counsel. 
Jay and Rudy are saying, tell us what you're talking about. Tell us what you want to, you know, what are you, why, what are you pursuing? So Mueller is pushing to obtain evidence from the president when there is no trial and no crime. How can the president's lawyers even evaluate, if they want to oppose the subpoena, how can they go argue to the court, well, listen, this isn't material to the matter at issue, because they don't even have it. Moreover, what factual information under the SB test could the president possibly provide that Don McGahn has not already provided in his three special counsel interviews for a total of, count them, 30 hours? Therefore, SB requirement that the evidence cannot be acquired elsewhere is not fulfilled. Mueller has one more trick up his sleeve, though, and that is the issues, the questions that were leaked. Unbelievably, believably, some of those leaked sample questions ask what the president thought, what the president thought about various situations, such as Comey's January uh, briefing of him when he was president-elect and Comey's testimony before the House Intel Committee. I was raised Catholic. I'm not surprised by the concept of going to confession and saying I had impure thoughts and then getting five Hail Marys. But what does the president's thoughts have to do with his carrying out his Article II functions? When did we criminalize thoughts? In sum, the president should not answer one question about any act since he became president, not a one. The only deal the president should accept is that after first being provided a written description of the matter at issue about any pre-presidential conduct, he should respond, but only if the evidence sought fulfills the SB test. That's it. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, I notice, uh, I think you and Judge Starr actually might disagree on a few matters based on the positions. Did he, he shake his head no when, when I was, he was independent counsel. No, no. But uh, Cy, why don't you go ahead, and then I'll ask you all a few questions. Well, it's a pleasure being here. Um, thanks so much for having this. Uh, I had the honor of meeting Judge Starr about 20 years ago um, at a conference at the University of Minnesota, it was a conference on executive privilege. And mm -hmm. it was my first academic conference. I was bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. <laughs> and uh, I got there, and I saw a huge auditorium with maybe, I don't know, 2,000 people. And I thought, this is what a normal academic conference is like. Right? This, this is the sort of crowd I can expect for all these academic conferences. It was a very interesting panel on executive privilege. It was about United States versus Nixon, the Nixon tapes case. And uh, Judge Starr was clearly the star attraction, as he is today. Right? I'm going to try to get out of the way here. I do have three points that I'd like to make. First, actually, before I make them, though, is you know, the judge didn't show you his book. And part of the reason we're here is to entice you to buy the book. You know, I was thinking it should be called the Ken Starr Report Part 2, or maybe, you know, um, you know something like Ken Starr Strikes Back. I've, I've, I've read parts of it, and it's quite good. It's very well written. It's very interesting, and it's very gripping. So I, I do highly recommend it to each and every one of you, and I understand there's a little stand outside the door. Um, so my, my three points have to do with the constitutionality of these sorts of investigations. My first point is that Prosecution is an executive function. It was so in England, where Blackstone said the crown is the proper prosecutor of all criminal offenses. It was so in America. Right? Alexander Hamilton says that the president is the constitutional executor of the law. Why does he say that? Because the president has the executive power. It's the power to execute the law. That's what it is principally. Um, and not surprisingly, early presidents control prosecution. We don't do this anymore. Maybe there are good reasons why we don't. But Washington would direct prosecutions as president. He would tell prosecutors to bring prosecutions. He would tell them to stop prosecutions. John Adams did the exact same thing. He would read the newspaper every day, the opposition press, find things he thought were seditious, and then write to his prosecutors and say, prosecute these people. Now, a lot of us don't like the Sedition Act. I'm not encouraging President Trump to do this. But uh, it was entirely constitutional. The complaints that were made were about the act, not presidential direction, because Washington had already done this. And then finally, Thomas Jefferson did the same thing. John has a wonderful article on the Burr, the Burr trial, uh, the Burr trial of, um, you know, by, of, by John Marshall of Aaron Burr. And John expertly shows how Thomas Jefferson directed the U.S. attorney, John Hay, 
intimately, like, you know, almost on a, a weekly basis, Thomas Jefferson was telling the attorney what to do. So this is entirely constitutional for the president to direct prosecution. It's part of his power, um, and he has to decide whether to do it. I think we now have a custom of presidents not doing this, and that's probably not a bad idea because presidents don't know what's going on in all these trials across the country. But it's entirely constitutional because it is the executive power to control law execution and to control those who are executing the law, including US prosecutors. There's nothing in any statute that says any of this. Right? Each of these presidents understood that they had constitutional power to do it. My second point has to do with the independent counsel statute that, that uh, Judge Starr referenced earlier. That statute, um, which came out of the Watergate reforms in 1978, basically authorized judges to appoint an independent prosecutor. And the idea was we don't want to have a special prosecutor fired again, so we're going to create a statute that precludes this from happening. We're going to have judges appoint this person. Can't, Judge Starr was appointed by judges. We're going to have judges appoint this person, and the person can only be removed for cause. And uh, Ted Olson brought a case <coughs> challenging the constitutionality of the independent counsel statute. And as many of you know, it went up to the Supreme Court, and the court in a seven to one decision called Morrison versus Olson decided that the independent counsel statute was constitutional. And it was a very long opinion. It was written by Chief Justice Rehnquist with a dissent by Justice Scalia. Um, but the court basically said, you know, we have prosecutions and executive function, but we don't see what the we don't see what the big deal is. I think that's the way I'd put it in legal technical terms, with taking this one little bit of, of executive authority away from the president. And then we also don't think that uh, Alexia Morrison, the independent counsel, um, is a non-inferior officer. As you may know, the Constitution establishes this uh, appointments clause, which says appointments have to be made by and with the advice and consent of the Senate. There's an exception to that clause, which says that Congress, by law, may vest the appointment of uh, of inferior officers with the president, the courts of law, or the heads of departments. And the court said, Alexia Morrison seems like an inferior officer to us. Uh, the, Ted Olson, who was the defendant in that case, said, no, she's not, because she has an unlimited budget. She can investigate you know, quite a bit. Uh, she doesn't have a, a, a term on her appointment. And she has four cause protection, meaning that she can't be removed unless she does something terribly wrong. And the court said that was constitutional in the seven to one opinion, Justice Scalia dissenting. And he, you know, it's a very famous dissent of his, perhaps his most famous dissent of all. And he's very famous for all his dissents. He was in a, he was in a lot of them. Uh, and he basically said the executive power belongs to the president in toto. Congress can't take it away. And it's, it's, it's very odd to think that the attorney general can control the independent counsel through this four cause protection when the four cause protection is designed to insulate the independent counsel, right? He, he said it's like treating manacles as an engine of locomotion. Right? You're trying to restrain the attorney general with this provision, not trying to give him authority over the independent counsel. And so he lost this case seven to one. But I think the judgment of history is that he won it. Because uh, after Judge Starr's investigation, a lot of Democrats came to see the wisdom of his, his opinion. And as Judge Starr noted, uh, the, the Democrats and the Republicans allowed the law to lapse. Uh, inexplicably to me, Janet Reno, I think in many, many ways, reconstituted the independent counsel under the special counsel regulations under the Department of Justice. Uh, it's not by statute now, it's by regulations, but I don't really know if there's much of a difference between the two. The special counsel also has four cause protection. The special counsel is not subject to the day-to-day -day control of the attorney general. The regulations talk about the special counsel being independent. So when you hear about special counsels and independent counsels, Judge Starr was an independent counsel who was very special. And Robert <laughs> Mueller is a special counsel who is very independent. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled very to clever. thinking that, that uh, you know, Robert <coughs> Rosenstein is peering over his shoulder and supervising him in some direct way. Um, he's not. Right? That's not what's going on. The, the regulations aren't designed to allow that, and Robert Rosenstein doesn't want to do that, uh, in part because I think he may have evidence about whether the president committed this crime of obstruction. Right? That's why he handed it off to, uh, to, uh, to Robert Mueller, I believe. So we, it's called the special counsel, but it's an independent counsel. Right? So when you see the words, you know, the, the Robert Mueller may be removed for cause, you should understand that just means no cause. 
Because no one is ever removed for cause. And do we think that people that have this protection never do anything wrong? That's just silly. Right? The president and the people who have the authority to remove people for cause just don't use the authority because they understand the scheme is designed to prevent them from, remo from removing people. Right? For cause protection is very similar to good behavior protection that ju federal judges have. And they never get removed. Right? They have to be caught accepting bribes or something. Right? There was the spect spectacle of a federal judge in, in, uh, in jail, and he was still in office collecting a salary. The, the Senate and the House had to impeach him and remove him from him to stop doing that. But my point is this for cause protection doesn't really work as, it's, as, it might, as you might think. Right? No one ever gets removed uh, for cause. And it's not because they're all... Uh, they're all um, not doing things that might be worthy of it. So I don't really believe that the independent, the special counsel regulations are really that different than the statute. They come from the attorney general rather than Congress. And so some people have suggested, you know, they can, they can just undo the regulations. You know, the, the attorney general can just, I guess, post something in the Federal Register saying we're revoking these regulations. And um, the attorney general or the acting attorney general in this case can just say there's cause here and then try to fire Mueller. But what's going to happen as soon as they do that? What's going to happen? Um, if it's possible for the President of the United States to commit obstruction of justice for firing James Comey, of course it's possible for Robert Rosenstein to be guilty of obstruction of justice for removing this reg and then firing Robert Mueller. Right? And so this idea that you're going to do this in the context of a situation where you might be charged with obstruction of justice makes it even more, you know, less likely that you're going to supervise this person because you're going to be accused of committing obstruction of justice. It doesn't, have to, it doesn't have to actually be true that you've committed obstruction of justice, right? There just has to be some colorable claim, and that will affect your willingness to, to supervise uh, Robert, Robert Mueller or, and or to fire him and or to remove this regulation. So I, I don't really think there, you know, J Judge Starr, I, I think, you know, I, I respectfully disagree. I don't really think there's much difference between the statute uh, and the regulation. I think they're both independent. And we have to think about the peculiar context. Alexia Morrison was investigating Ted Olson, who was an official in the Department of Justice. He went on to become uh, Solicitor General of the United States. In that context, Alexia Morrison was deemed by the Supreme Court to be an inferior officer. But Robert Mueller is investigating the President of the United States. Do we really think that he's inferior to anybody? He's standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with the president. In this particular context, if perhaps in no other, it's just silly to say that he's an inferior officer. There are people who are the assistant secretary of procurement and the assistant secretary of diversity, the assistant secretary of personnel management in departments that go to the Senate to get confirmed. This person hasn't been confirmed by the Senate. His office is far more powerful than the one, than, than ones that routinely go through a Senate confirmation and presidential nomination. You know, there's, there are reforms that you could do. One is to just say this is Congress's job, right? Congress can have its investigation of the president and, and decide what to do with uh, this president if, if he colluded with the Russians or he obstructed justice. That's one solution. I think another solution is if this is a good idea to have a special counsel investigate wrongdoing by the president, I think what you ought to be doing is you ought to say the entire, you know, Washington, D.C. government ought to be subject to a special counsel, right, who's just a permanent official that goes through Senate advice and consent, and they can investigate members of Congress and departmental secretaries, because special counsels and independent counsels, whatever you call them, have a very perverse incentive, right? Not all of them are trying to nail a scalp to the wall, but a lot of them are. And once you recognize that, and Justice Scalia talks about this expertly in Morrison versus Olson, once you recognize that, you will see that they have different incentives than do normal U.S. attorneys, right? A normal U.S. attorney has a jurisdiction of hundreds of thousands of people. So they, have to, they have to make choices about what to prosecute and, and what to let go. Uh, the special prosecutor, the independent counsel, whatever you want to call him or her, just doesn't have to make that choice. So if, if members of Congress can feel this pain and if departmental secretaries can, then at least we're all playing by the same sort of rules, right? But otherwise, all that we have is a situation where Basically, the executive branch is subject to these rules. What's, what's mind-boggling to me is that you know, uh, Janet Reno put these regulations in place, um, and it's a little mind-boggling that uh, you know, Robert Rosenstein decided to invoke them. Thank you. Very good. I was going to invoke for cause and stop you in a few seconds. <laughs> so 
Um, so I, before we turn to the independent counsel, I did want to ask uh, one set of questions about the Kavanaugh uh, uh, controversy and mm -hmm. the Senate's uh, decision to have a hearing on Monday where both uh, Judge Kavanaugh and Dr. Ford are uh, allegedly going to testify. Uh, each of you are uh, expert in different aspects of this. So uh, I'll just ask each of you uh, one question, and then we could turn back to the independent counsel. First, uh, for Judge Starr, um, Judge Kavanaugh worked for you. Uh, for many years directly as a trusted aide in the Whitewater investigation that's the subject of your book. Um, do you believe uh, the charges that are being made uh, against him? Uh, for Vicki, uh, you, you are both an expert as a prosecutor and as a staffer on Capitol Hill. Uh, what should the Senate do now? What procedure should the Senate follow mm -hmm. uh, to make sure there's a fair and full uh, airing of these issues? And then Cy, uh, what standard should senators apply to all this when they exercise their advice and consent function? Judge. I have great confidence uh, in the integrity uh, of Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, character flows out of daily uh, actions and, and interactions. When one is working alongside a person, uh, as I had the privilege of doing with Brett for a number of years in the independent counsel's office, also in private uh, law practice, and then watching with admiration his public career, his service in the executive branch, and his very distinguished service as, as a judge. Uh, that record of several decades, coupled with the outpouring of support for his integrity from those who knew him in these long ago days of high school, uh, persuades me that I believe <coughs> Brett Kavanaugh, and Brett Kavanaugh has been absolutely firm in saying it did not happen. Not that there may have been some episode uh, in her life which was very traumatic and was horrible and dignity denying and, and the like, but I did not do it. So I believe Brett Kavanaugh. I, I just can't help but ask, do you find that uh, Senators are being hypocritical in their approach to Kavanaugh versus their approach to <laughs> the matters that you were investigating. Hypocrisy in Washington, D.C.? <laughs> well, on I'll, both sides, uh, yeah. right? On both sides, the Republicans and Democrats. Well, they seem to have flipped there's, positions. There's no question that we can all uh, be hypocritical in daily life. <clears throat> I think a very powerful <clears throat> example uh, of the allegation of hypocrisy was made as recently as last evening by Juanita Broderick, who uh, claims to this day that she was forcibly raped by William Jefferson Clinton when he was the Attorney General of Arkansas uh, and uh, a candidate for the governor of the state. Pretty serious charge. And seeing her comment about uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein's response in the 90s <laughs> to those uh, allegations and contrasting those to her reaction to the just, so th there it is. I would just invoke the example so recently within the last 24 hours of Juanita Broderick's uh, public uh, statements. Uh, <clears throat> I have, uh, this goes beyond the question, so cut me off for a cause or, or otherwise, <laughs> but uh, I have expressed now several times grave concern with the process. I love Felix Frankfurter's quote, the history of liberty is largely the history of procedure. Procedure counts. Now, we're not on a court of law. It's a political process, and we all understand that. But there is orderly procedure. And the very fact, and I don't need to rehearse all the facts before this audience, that the senator would not act on these then anonymous allegations and bring it forward for the consideration of the committee, including during executive session, when it was reviewing FBI files, really concerns me. And let me have a footnote about FBI files. I've had the uh, heavy responsibility of reviewing FBI files. FBI files contain the vilest kinds of information because the FBI special agent in conducting a background investigation, at least fan out across the country or whatever is appropriate, they will faithfully and I think professionally take down whatever the person tells them. And they can seek privacy and confidentiality. 
you can spill out all manner of charges against someone when the FBI is special agent. Now, it is, as we know, a crime to lie to the federal agency. They have to, elements of proof and so forth. My point is, FBI f investigations mm -hmm. tend to be very thorough, very comprehensive, and to have six FBI files, it is no surprise to me that the committee in this age of transparency went into executive session because the material in those files should not be made known to the general public. Apparently, the, my understanding is, uh, Senator Feinstein did not even attend the hearing, uh, nor at that occasion when it certainly would have been proper to bring that information forward, did she bring that information forward even though, again, she did not attend the meeting or whatever. So I think the brokenness of the process is something that has to be taken into account. The lateness, the call it dilatory tactics. Why would you sit on this if you then found it's so credible that now the entire nation's business has virtually come to an end? So it does raise very serious questions in terms of the fairness, ultimately, to Brett Kavanaugh and his family, as well as, obviously, to the accuser, but also to the Supreme Court of the United States. This process had been set forth at the beginning of the summer with Justice Kennedy in very timely manner saying, I am retiring. The president made his decision, which I think was a wise and terrific decision on the merits, chooses Judge Kavanaugh. Mm -hmm. And this process has now been set in motion literally for several months. And all of a sudden now, we will not proceed on the basis that had been laid out so clearly and reasonably beforehand. So I, I, I just, I, perfect I wanna, segue to Vicki. Yeah. 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 I've been throwing right. the ball. I just want to say something about someone you mentioned, Juanita Broderick, and Lisa Myers, one of the truth seekers. Uh, Lisa was taken off the air for several months after she aired her story about Juanita Broderick. And it's one of the reasons why Lisa is playing golf in Florida now instead of still with NBC. And there were just a, many of those that, that occurred. Um, one of mine being one of the latest in the, in the Benghazi interview. Um, and what should this, the, the Senate do? I conducted Senate hearings as chief counsel of the Senate Intelligence Committee and again as chief investigator for the investigation of the Ron Carey Teamsters. So I've been there, done that. Uh, it's very difficult for this because we don't know when it occurred. We, she doesn't remember where it occurred. So this vague accusation of 36 years ago, how does anyone defend himself against that? So the question is, how does the Senate handle it? My recommendation to Chuck Grassley is get a person in there who's a, a, a veteran prosecutor, veteran lawyer, veteran trial <clears throat> lawyer, and have that person question her rather than put any of these political senators in the position of having to decide whether to be too nice or too mean or whatever the, the senator has to do. Take it out of the political arena and put it into more of a litigation arena because she has to be questioned and the, Dem the Democrats are, not, are, are, are saying, well, if you're of trouble, if you're really mean to her, it'll be Anita Hill all over again. You've got to be able to avoid that kind of situation. Uh, well, you know, I, <laughs> I think the way to think about this is just an entirely political process, right? So if you recall that there was some, I think, some drunk driving conviction of George Eight, sorry, George W. Bush that came out in the last week of the campaign between he and Al Gore. And you know, they were obviously sitting on that. This is not something they found out at the end, but they thought this might throw, you know, throw the election one way or the other. It did. And, and Well, you know, I don't know. I mean, it did still, into turmoil. Right. So I mean, this is just something similar. Or, or I guess I could say it can conceivably be something similar, right? I don't, I don't know for certain what's going on here. But I do know this happened to Justice Thomas as well. And, and if you believe that the court is a political institution, you're going to use political tactics to uh, you know, promote your candidates and obstruct uh, the, the other party's candidates. So I'm not, I'm not, I guess I'm not that surprised that this has happened, because it's happened, in, to my mind, once before. And it will happen again. Um, I, you know, I don't know what you can do about this. I think the, some Republicans want to think of the court as just something, if you have enough credentials, you should just be on it. 
But that's clearly not how everybody thinks about the court. Right? It's not a situation where if you have a sterling resume, you should be presumptively uh, on the court if, if the president nominates you. And, is, and if people don't think that, they're not going to play by those rules when someone like uh, Brett Kavanaugh is, is nominated. So uh, this, to me, uh, is you know the particular you know contours of the allegation aren't predictable, but uh, the idea that you would spring something on a candidate at the last second to delay the vote, whether or not that happened here, I don't think that that's surprising. Okay, um, let's uh, turn. We have about ten minutes before I ask for uh, questions from the audience. Why don't we uh, turn back to the independent counsel question? So first off, what do you make of the plea bargain by Paul Manafort at the end of last week? Uh, should President Trump be worried? What, the, what, what assistance could Manafort be providing the independent counsel? Should President Trump fire, consider firing Mueller as he's allegedly considering firing the attorney general right after the midterm elections because of the course of the investigation? I want to defer to uh, Victoria, but before Vicky responds, because she's certainly more knowledgeable than I, given her vast experience, but a couple of observations. <clears throat> One, as a prosecutor, you want the defendant, the target, the subject to cooperate with you. And you want that target, that subject, that former defendant, to be truthful with you. I thought the wording of the agreement uh, between Manafort uh, and the uh, special counsel's uh, office used exactly the right. You're to cooperate fully and truthfully. Uh, it is you now, and we used to say during the prosecution, I talk about this in the book, we would tell uh, potential cooperating witnesses or those who had, in fact, entered a guilty plea. And all of our guilty pleas were righteous. I know there are those who... And we may hear it uh, from Vicky and others. Oh, no, a lot of these uh, uh, pleas that uh, Bob Mueller has gotten are, 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 not, are not righteous. Uh, I'm not going to judge that, but what I do know is that every one of our guilty pleas was completely righteous based on actual facts and actual crimes. <clears throat> but we were very eager to get cooperation. And so for Mueller to have achieved this early on, he had the hammer of the second trial with great exposure, just gets us toward the end of the investigation much more quickly than otherwise. Next, as far as we know, other than the June uh, 2016 meeting in Trump Tower, we've seen public reports about Paul Manafort's participation, which seemed minor, modest, and so forth. And the meeting itself seems to me, from what we know, to amount to virtually nothing, certainly nothing criminal, nothing suggesting collusion. And collusion as a crime is a very interesting topic uh, in and of itself. Uh, so I think I'm seeing it is let's get to the end of this as soon as possible. And in terms of the power of what uh, Paul Manafort may be able to say, I would think that one cooperating witness named Rick uh, Gates, who has apparently already been uh, cooperating, sentencing has been postponed, that suggests that the cooperation is in fact real and continuing, that's a sign of health in the relationship. If, when you see the sentencing date has been set, that means the special counsel is either satisfied with the witness or is about to wash his hands of the witness, one of the two. You never know until it comes to whether, did the special counsel move for downward departure? I think that uh, with the indictments of the Russians, final thing, I'm going on too long, with the indictment of the 11 Russians and the two Russian organizations, and those indictments read very powerfully about Russian interference uh, and lavishly funded Russian interference in the investigation, what those inv indictments do not suggest one word of is collusion, conspiracy with the Trump organization, the Trump campaign. In fact, Rod Rosenstein made that very clear when he announced the latest indictment. Now, it's a very strange, I mean, as a prosecutor, we really, when I was at the Justice Department, it was rare that we indicted somebody who we knew we would never get. We did it only with terrorism, which was under me, and we did that because then that sort of precluded the person's ability to travel in various places because we could put out a worldwide warrant for them. But I, I, it's, a very, it's a very bizarre um, uh, case. And the, 
we won't get bogged down into the legal legalities, but Sai and I have been looking at the briefs filed because there is one Russian company that's challenging it named Concord, been hardly ever reported. And um, they're, they're challenging this inferior superior officer yeah. uh, uh, issue. It's a very interesting reading. Um, the cooperation by Manafort, like, I don't know what he would know that, um, uh, uh, what's his name, the, the, the Gates yeah, does, doesn't Gates. know. And Gates has been cooperating for, for months, so I don't know that Paul Manafort knows anything more about the president. But who was Manafort working with? The Podesta group. Podesta in the crosshairs? I don't know. It's mm. rare that a Democrat ever gets looked at by the Mueller team. But, <laughs> but that's the extra information that Manafort would have that Gates might, might, might not even have. But I want to bring up just a legal issue for us to mull. And John, you and I have talked about this before, and I want us to pursue it at some, some point. Can, why, what is this? Perjury is supposed to be lying about a material fact. If Papa Dope, as I call him, had told the truth, it wouldn't have been, if he had said, yeah, I met with the Russians on the days that he did, it wouldn't have been a crime. Mike Flynn, General Flynn, could have conversations with the Russian ambassador. There was nothing wrong with that. And they, and they already had the um, transcript of what he said. So why was that? I say it was a pretense that they came to interview him. And I they were saying, because they knew what he had said. And if something was wrong, they could have indicted him on that. So my query is, if the FBI comes to me and said, what did you have for breakfast? And I do not want to admit that it was the glazed donut. And I say, <laughs> and I say yogurt. To me, these the questioning about something that's legal, if you tell the truth, I don't know how that gets you to materiality. And John and I have talked about it briefly, and I don't think there's any Supreme Court uh, case on it. And uh, I've talked with, about it with another client who you would know, uh, who they looked at well, with Scooter Libby uh, yeah. during his case, because mm. they looked at it. Everyone knows about Scooter, and then we got him a pardon. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Much deserved. Um, but um, this is really, I think, a very important issue. If the, if the FBI comes and talks to you about something that is not a crime, and you don't tell the truth about it, is that material? Great question. I, uh, Vicki, just to uh, follow up on you. And what are we supposed to make of President Trump's decision to declassify the FISA uh, warrant application for Carter Page and then all these texts at the Justice Department uh, coming right after the Manafort plea? Do you think they're... No, that wasn't the, time. That wasn't the reason for the time. That wasn't <laughs> they're, they're not at all connected or... No, what, what, no that, 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 there's why, no why connection it, there whatsoever. They were, this has been in the works for quite a while. And there, there are those of us who have been pounding that this, this should be done. I, I, it's frightening. It is frightening what happened to Carter Page. A US citizen who, by the way, cooperated with the federal government. He was an asset to the FBI in indicting a Russian who had approached him and asked for intelligence information. He participated and helped the FBI get the indictment. And according to my knowledge, and I'm waiting for, to see that document, According to what I'm told by sources who should know, um, the FBI made it look like Carter Page was uh, in cahoots with the Russians back two, two years ago. Mm. And it was on that kind of basis that they proceeded in going after him. So I think we really need to look at this. This is frightening. 1978, the year of the Independent Council Statute, that was also the year of FISA. And I worked on it a lot yeah. as, in, in, in its infancy as chief counsel for the Senate Intelligence Committee for or Goldwater. This is, and I was always of the, oh, listen, you know, we need these powers. Nobody would really hurt those. I, I mean, I am appalled at the thought of what I think occurred here. And that is going after, they went after Carter after he was named in March of 2016 on the presidential committee. That's when they started going after him. Not until he was assigned, because I have to represent people. I know all these, yeah. the underlying facts. Uh, in March, he was appointed for the foreign policy team, and it was within a few weeks that they started going after him and looking at his background. And the, and the Papa Dope thing, you know, is the same, the same thing. It's very frightening that this was, that this was a, a set up. Let me, yeah. let me ask uh, the question Sai ended with, um, which in a way is interesting. Suggested that Mueller is equally, if not more, independent than you were. So let me 
uh, ask, and then I'll t uh, a call for questions from the audience. Um, should, can the president fire Mueller? Should he fire Mueller? Were you ever worried about being fired? At times, I, I would have welcomed it. <laughs> <laughs> and the statute did give, and this is one of the many oddities uh, of the uh, independent counsel statute, so the attorney general could fire for cause. Uh, that was not done. Uh, even though there were all kinds of accusations, and the Attorney General and I recount this in the book, launched an investigation which I said, you do not have the authority to do that. You can fire me, but you can't send folks in to rummage through our files and interview our people and so forth. And we ended up having a bit of a standoff uh, on, on that. But it does go to show the tensions when this executive branch function is being carried on by, quote, this independent uh, officer. I do want to make one comment if I may, because I think this is important in terms of the conversation about uh, impeachment. One of the mischievous things about the independent counsel statute is that it created this road toward impeachment, and it created a dynamic toward impeachment. Not so with the special counsel regulations. What do I mean? A specific provision of the statute, and this is what we were being obedient to, and filing the referral with the House of Representatives required the independent counsel shall refer to the House of Representatives when, and here is the rather low threshold, substantial and credible information has come to the independent counsel that an impeachable offense, not defined, may have been committed. It's a dragnet kind of provision. So, you can see that before we got to the question of can the president be indicted as a constitutional matter, we were given a statutory route directly to the House of Representatives. That mischievous provision, a low trigger for here it is, the public now knows that there's substantial and credible information that impeachable events may have been committed, very broad, very ambiguous, uh, is needless to say no longer part of the special counsel provisions. The other thing is there is a check and a balance here uh, under the present uh, uh, domain, and that is that before any, I'm going to paraphrase, major decision is made by the uh, special counsel, the special counsel must consult with the attorney general. I did not have that. There were checks and balances in place, some of which we put in place, but that is a, an assurance uh, whether some are assured by it or not, but there is an assurance that a Bob Mueller is not simply out on a roving commission expedition. But it doesn't say that they can Ant. be overruled. And that's the point about the inferior superior officer. Yeah, it, that's it's true. like Rod Rosenstein can't say, no, I'm directing you not to do that. Consult is really iffy. What if Mueller decides, well, the regulation says, doesn't say he can't refer something to the House for impeachment. What if Mueller decides to do that? Is there anything that could stop him? No, I say you can't, well, for, regarding the president, yes. I say you can't, you can't send anything to the, to the House, uh, the legislative function. You can't use the executive branch function to get stuff to give to the legislature. I'm glad Cy has the regulations. You may not want to keep us here, <laughs> but uh, instead of describing them, we can, we can go to them. I think that that would be okay, not the strongest argument, but that would be utterly incompatible with the whole spirit and thrust of these regulations, which is he is an officer of the Justice Department. He could not send a report to Congress without the approval of Rod Rosenstein. So we have about uh, 15 minutes. But just what is the Constitution? See, I say the Constitution doesn't approve. Nah, you're wrong about that. I so we have about 15 minutes. <laughs> I disagree with you. <laughs> we have about 15, just a little under 15 minutes for a question and answer. So. Uh, there's a mic in the back. Wait for it to come to you. Please state your name and affiliation, and please ask a real question. And we have question. one Baylor Bear with the <laughs> Caleb. Okay, Caleb. whoever the, he wants so. to call on the Baylor person, which yeah. is obvious so. to tell just from someone's external appearance, I suppose, <laughs> that you went to Baylor. So <laughs> judge which person is there. Oh, Caleb. Oh, hi, everyone. Oh, you yeah. went to Baylor. I did. Yeah. But you're actually just moving the microphone. I'm right. Ah, yes. okay. I just then want you, you to recognize. Have a right there, the closest <laughs> person to you. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Nicole Penn. I'm a research assistant here. I work for Lynn Cheney. Um, so uh -oh. I was just wondering <laughs> if um, you could go back to the Burr trial. And um, uh -huh. although Jefferson was <laughs> subpoenaed and he, he questioned whether he really could be subpoenaed, he did turn over the documents or right. some summary of them. So what precedent did that set or not set for what could be done in the 21st century? I actually wrote oh. this long article oh, about this right. that Saw I mentioned. Exactly. I was actually at that uh, conference, too, yeah. where you had the 2000. He also forgot to mention the guy with the sign who walked around saying, impeach star, impeach star. <laughs> <laughs> he forgot that one. Yeah. And my response, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> uh, so yeah, in the Burr trial, uh, President Jefferson was a witness. Aaron Burr, who was on tr uh, trial for treason, John Marshall, Chief Justice John Marshall happened to be the trial judge. Burr actually said that on the way to committing his uprising in Louisiana Territory, that he had stopped in Washington, talked to Jefferson, and that Jefferson had personally approved the whole expedition. It was just very similar to today, in a way. So, uh, so Marshall uh, issued a subpoena for the records, which Jefferson turned over in edited form with deletions for executive privilege. This is the first time the president actually claimed executive privilege. And then... Marshall subpoenaed him to appear as a witness. And Jefferson uh, at first pretended he didn't get the letter. And then the second time, Jefferson made the same arguments that Clinton made against the independent counsel. I, I can't be dragged back and forth around the country. Uh, how could I do my job as president? Actually, Clinton's team didn't know about this. So they should have cited Jefferson. The argument <laughs> came from Jefferson. Um, and actually, the interesting story is Marshall, didn't, Marshall dropped it. He didn't actually try to order the president to obey the subpoena when Jefferson refused to appear. But the moral of the story, what happened in the end, Burr was acquitted. So in, in a way, that's, right, it's, it's an interesting question. What if Trump refuses to, to cooperate with all of the independent counsel activities? In the end, it means that Mueller can't actually go forward with a lot of these prosecutions as fully as he might like. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is really cool. This has never happened before you have in my time here. Like bearing person. Somebody's probably over here. Hi, Deborah Weiss, Center for Security Policy. My question is, what is the scope of the special counsel's mandate? How specific does the mandate have to be and does did this meet the test with the Mueller investigation? And second, I just want to um, add that Judge you Starr, you said on. that the question here is how do we investigate the president? And clearly that is what Mueller's doing, but I thought the question was supposed to be the investigation on Russia, so thank you. you yeah, well, the, the, so. the mandate, I mean, I, Rod Rosenstein's a better lawyer than this. I can't, I, I, I don't know, it just boggles my mind. It, it's, it's basically this, any link between the Russian government and the anyone associated with the Trump campaign, words, words pretty close to that. And I say that means that the, the, the uh, corn farmer in Iowa who was co-chairman of the Trump campaign and sells corn to Russia could be investigated under that. It was just, I mean, there's no time limitation, no real subject matter. It was just like, wow, you know, expensive as can be. And it's, I think, that this should be a crime. You should have a criminal uh, 18 USC in mind when you're, when you're doing that. It was a counterintelligence investigation, which is a very big deal for those of us who've worked in the Justice Department and on the criminal side and understand the counterintelligence side. They use different agents. There are different rules altogether. And it was, uh, as, as um, uh, Mueller said uh, when he was testifying, no, I, it wasn't Mueller, I'm sorry, it was Comey, said, well, we have a counterintelligence never said it was a criminal investigation, although the Democrats like to just jump into it and say, well, the president's under criminal investigation. It's never been said. It's a point of clarification is your question. The second question uh, having to do with the pre-presidential nature of this activity. If I understood, I may have misapprehended your question. You said it's an investigation of Russia, what is the investigation of, of, of the president? Could we give her the mic again? Sorry. Thank you. I'm wondering if the mandate, well, I guess it was two things. One is I was wondering if the mandate was meeting 
the requirement to be specific and restrictive enough. And the second thing that you're referring to was, yeah, it's saying, are they even complying with the mandate? What, what's the mandate? I thought it was supposed well, to be a Russian investigation, but it seems to be an investigation but we don't know. of the president. Yes, I, I okay. understand. Go ahead. I was just going to say, we don't know to what extent uh, Rod Rosenstein has expanded that original mandate. I mean, there are other appointments and the like, and Janet Reno, specifically to go back to my book and my own experience, which is parallel, it may not be exactly on point, there were times under the statute when she would say, essentially calling us up, would you please review the travel office firings? Would you please review the FBI files matter? And we would say, yes, if you want us to do that, we will do that. The same kinds of conversations, I'm sure, go on between Mueller and Rosenstein. Now, Vicki, you may want to correct some of that, but that's my understanding of how the regulations would actually operate in practice. Well, it's my understanding that uh, uh, Mueller came back to go after Paul Manafort because, of course, that had nothing to do with the Russian or the Trump campaign and collusion, whatever that is, with Russia. It had to do with all these kinds of uh, financial crimes. Sorry. So it says here the special counsel will be provided a specific factual statement of the matter to be investigated. Uh, but then it goes on to state that if in the course of his or her investigation the special counsel concludes that additional jurisdiction beyond that specified as an original jurisdiction is necessary, he or she shall consult with the Attorney General. So I, my understanding is uh, that there have been conversations between the special counsel and, the, and, the, and Robert Rosenstein to expand the jurisdiction. And that's why we are you know, talking about well, things other the, than the Well, in fact, the Russian. Virginia judge demanded to the, that expansion. And I don't recall ever reading it, but I do recall that that, that was an issue in the, in the case for Manafort with all the taxes. It could well be yeah. classified. I mean, it doesn't have to be public, does it, Sign? I don't think so, no. But that's but when you say any link between the, the Russian government and the Trump anyone associated with the Trump campaign, it's not a very specific statement of that. Right here. Um, this is for Judge Starr, and in your retirement, I'm recommending you go back to the D.C. Circuit. I think you'd be very good there. <laughs> I didn't notice he was retired. Well, <laughs> his new career, his new outlook on life. Um, <laughs> Thank you, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Another opportunity yeah. you can't refuse, right? <laughs> um, the Senate confirmation hearing would be quite interesting. Yeah, we'll, we'll get the file out, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, the questions would be good. Um, I, I just, I'm trying to link what we're talking about today's situation with the whitewater, which is what your expertise was. And it, I, as far as I recall, there was an issue there, one of bajillion issues, but about the Treasury Department and the RTC yes. and the communication with the White House and the scope of the investigation. There was a criminal investigation there. That's and correct. were they allowed to communicate or not communicate? And were, did they have independent chains of command? I just wonder how that would compare to today's situation. Oh, that's okay. a very interesting, yeah. We were, in fact, uh, part of the investigation I inherited from my distinguished predecessor, Bob Fisk, was whether there was improper political interference that might constitute conceivably an obstruction of justice. But Maine Treasury, and specifically uh, Roger Altman, the Deputy uh, Secretary of the Treasury, and the Independent Resolution Trust Corporation. Uh, and so that was what I inherited from him. Now, when you go back to his charter, nothing about that. But he interpreted the charter in terms of arising out of and relating to these very broad words, but especially relating to jurisdiction. Arising out of gives us some really neat questions in federal jurisdiction. But relating to is a term that Congress frequently uses in statute and is almost universally interpreted by the courts as that's really broad. That doesn't mean anything and everything is related to in this postmodern era, but it means that Congress saw fit to give a broad grant of jurisdiction. And that, I think, is the way Bob interpreted his mandate uh, from the Attorney General to authorize him to look into that. Uh, well, we just have about uh, 15 seconds. So <laughs> I think I'll end. Oh, is there one more quick question? Okay. 
Hold on one second. Uh, Frank Lockwood, Arkansas Democrat Gazette. Uh oh, uh, you dedicated <laughs> finally. You, uh, <laughs> you dedicated the book to the people of Little Rock. I was surprised by that. What made you decide to do that? Thank you for asking that, because one of the things that I say in the book after the so read beyond the dedication. One of the things I say in the book is throughout my experience in Little Rock, and I share several specific examples of this. The people of Little Rock were unfailingly gracious and hospitable. Now, I didn't get a lot of social invitations, <laughs> but Little Rock is a very gracious place filled with very good people. And one story that I do tell in the book is a very prominent person saying to me early on at an event that you may have attended, because uh, there were a number of journalists there. They just said, we're not going to ask you any questions about this, but, but here you are. You've taken on for Bob Fisk, so we'd like to know you. And so this person then says, I want you to know this is very hard for us uh, because we know these people. Uh, some of them, we go to church. Jim Guy Tucker was a Sunday school teacher, First Presbyterian in downtown. Uh, we know them. We go to the same restaurants and so forth. We like these people. And then... This person said, but we want to know what happened. And so there it was. You shall know the truth. So they were they were friends and so forth. I also recount, I'm sure may I tell one more war story? No. Can't stop you. Now, oh, great. Uh, for good cause. And the clock, we do have a clock here, so it's very digital. And that is, so we had had a pretty rough trial day with Jim Guy, the governor he was an enormously able guy. I just wish he hadn't been quite, you know, I wish he'd been more honest. Uh, you mean you wish he wasn't a criminal? Yeah. Okay. Did, and my job would have been easier. <laughs> and James and Susan McDougall, and bless their hearts, and God rest his soul, they were crooks. They were just crooks. Uh, and we proved it beyond a reasonable doubt uh, 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 before, that, before that jury. So anyway, it had been a pretty rough morning. And so I treat the trial team to Luby's, one of my favorite bistros, but it's cafeteria based in my hometown of San Antonio. And so a nice guy comes up to me and says, well, how's the trial going? And, well, it hadn't gone that well that morning. And I put the best face. I said, we love our judge, Judge George Howard Jr., honest person, grew up in segregated Arkansas, African-American judge, appointed by Jimmy Butters. He is a, such an honorable judge. He's doing, the jury is very attentive. It's a very representative jury. The experts said, oh, this is a pro-defense jury. Jim Guy's going to walk. Susan will probably walk. Jim Guy will probably get convicted. It's, I'm, I'm seeing uh, Jim McGill will probably get convicted. All three were convicted. And so I said, well, but, uh, but thank you for asking. And he said, well, to be honest, I'm rooting for the other side. Well, that's Little Rock. <laughs> you know? Nice people. Well, I'm not rooting for the other side. <laughs> uh, but I want to uh, please uh, join me in uh, thanking our three panelists, and Judge Starr especially, and thank you for coming to AI today. And there'll be an, uh, there'll be an opportunity to uh, buy signed copies of the book right uh, out in the alley here. Not alley, in the passageway. <laughs> you got me thinking about Little Rock and the things that happened there. In the passageway right here, uh, directly after the panel. Thank you very much.